So understanding machine learning with statistical physics, that's kind of a generic title so that everything I do in the last, say, four or five years kind of fits in it. So I start with the with a list of my collaborators and the blue ones are those that, uh, that contributed to the slides that will come later on. I will kind of show you, because there were so many things that I want to show you about that, that in some parts of the talk it will be more like um, keywords about a paper that you can ask later and then there will be two chunks that will be kind of more coherent without actually having them to ask about what is actually in the paper. So to start, I just have a few motivational slides, you know, kind of everybody knows, but I still say it, right? So there is this revolutionary progress in machine learning that we are all observing. And some of the open questions that in theory we are looking at, and that seems to be still kind of mysterious and unanswered, you know, here I take a snapshot of an article that I have read recently. Maybe you know it, I didn't. Why don't heavily parameterized neural networks overfit the data? That's what we often think about. What is the effective uh, number of parameters? The kind of right notion of complexity that would tell us what's the number of samples indirectly that we need to learn well. Why does backpropagation, which is just gradient descent, head for, or doesn't backpropagation head for poor local minima or even poor global minima, but heads for good global minima? So the kind of striking thing about this, this, this article is that it's from this piece called Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPS by Leo Breinman from 25 years ago, right? So while these are the questions we are still asking today and while there was so much that happened on the engineering and empirical side in the past 20 years, on the theory also a lot happened, but we are still quite not there, right? These are still the questions to be answered. So with that, kind of what, wh why is it so hard? What is kind of missing in the, in the way we are doing the research to, um, why don't we have those answers yet? So kind of in my way of thinking about it, I kind of came to the, this, this kind of little diagram to, to, to put things into, into perspective, that actually understanding machine learning or deep learning, we kind of need to take into interplay the three following ingredients, the structure of the data, the architecture and the algorithm, right? And the three of them together. Because if say we kicked the algorithm and didn't care about the problem being tractable, then we can do beautiful theory, but then we don't know whether we have a efficient algorithm, so that would not be good. If we kicked out the data structure and just kept the algorithmic tractability and the architecture, well, we have algorithmic complexity results that even just few layer, very simple neural network is NP hard to be learned if we actually looked at the worst case data structure. So we cannot think of the worst case data structure because the theory that we are looking for cannot be so generic. So we need to model the data structure. We cannot be kicking that out of the picture. And finally, the architecture there, you know, it's somehow the empirical evidence is so overwhelming that the deep and the depth is kind of responsible for something that we better keep that in the picture. Or not, you know, we don't really have a proof that something like kernel cannot be so good, but kind of the empirical evidence is there that looking at the deep architectures is kind of something to do. So, so really the structure here is structure of the data. Yeah. Of the data, yeah, of, the, of the input data. There are actually two parts, right? It's the structure of the input data and then the structure of the function from the inputs to the output. So both of them. So, so both of them are, are kind of key and how they are related to each other. So of course there are many ways kind of to phrase it. And okay, here the next slide is kind of, please don't shout at me, but when I kind of thought about the traditional kind of fields that care about learning, you know, they kind of split on one side of this triangle, right? The computer science optimization theory would be here and the approximation and learning may be here and the signal processing and maybe the models in statistics that, that uh, model the, 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 the statistical dependencies here. You know, this is very like very, it's, you know, I'm not insisting on anything, but you know, roughly each of these fields is looking at one side and none of it is really sitting in the middle. So we kind of need to sit in the middle. So you know, this, is, this is very interesting because when I was this summer, you know, I had this picture since maybe a year that I'm showing it in my slides. 
But this summer I was listening to Elhanan Stock at the Simons Institute for Ber Berkeley, and, and he, this is a snapshot of his slide. And he was giving three criteria that he phrases it a little bit differently, but basically his realism is my like data structure here. And the fact that you need a provable efficient algorithm is the algorithm and the depth is the architecture. So it's not quite the same focus, but it's very much related. So, so you know, and, and this is probably the, you know, people don't show something like that like so often. Like this is the, the, the case that, that is strikingly so similar. And we didn't kind of know about that, right? We just, I just wrote, oh, well, Helen, this is so interesting. I have basically the same slide. So there was the physics in my, in so, so, so far, you know, machine learning, this is kind of, you know, people that uh, study machine learning know, so that's just my take on it. How does the physics kind of enter? So this I like to, you know, just put it into one or two motivational slides by grabbing this snapshot of what uh, Jan Lekan posted on his Facebook after lecturing in a school that we organized in France called Statistical Physics and Machine Learning Back Together. So he was saying that there is a long history of theoretical physicists bringing ideas and mathematical methods to machine learning, neural networks, probabilistic inference, such problems, etc. And then with the prevalence of deep learning and all the theoretical questions that surround it, physicists are coming back. And this is just a Facebook post, but in his lecture, he kind of was demonstrating them by showing another conference that he attended also in France a long time ago. Back then when he was just after his PhD, and he was already interested in neural networks and had some, you know, course of the convnets in his in his head already, etc. But he was saying that back then nobody, literally nobody, was interested to listen to him except the physicist. And the physicist organized this conference. And here, you know, there are there is a proceeding from there. So the names, kind of, you know, you must, you know, Jan Lecan wrote a paper there and. Isabel Guion, the, you know, SVD, and, and then there are some famous physicists like high energy particle physicists, Novira Soro, and many of you know Hopfield and Mark Mazar. So this was a really, you know, interesting kind of mix. Back then, people actually talked to each other. So, so this is one slide that is kind of uh, philosophical, but I think, you know, maybe empty, but I think it's still important to say it about the meaning of a model, kind of what is a model in data science or statistics is basically, I would rather call it an ansatz. It's some ansatz for a function that we use to fit the data, right? So for instance, for in regression, the best straight line that captures the dependence of uh, y on x. So in physics, we would not call that a model. In model, kind of in physics, the word model is used differently. For instance, a model would be this Ising model, which is just, you know, you imagine there is a lattice and on nodes of the lattice there are pluses and minuses living, and then there is a probability distribution related to it. So it's a mathematical object. But when we actually study this object, we understand why a magnet at a certain temperature is not a magnet anymore, right? It's not, you know, there is a lot missing here. There are no electrons, there are no no quantum mechanics, no interactions as in real magnets, so a lot is missed. Yet this model describes and explains how magnetism works. So when we think of models in physics, we don't actually think of something that describes realistically the data, right? Ising model doesn't describe realistically how magnets work, but the nature of what's happening is captured there. So we are looking for something like that. So it's not always clear whether it is there or not, right? So, but so, so it's just to say, you know, the critics like, okay, and here you don't have like something that the realistic data have. That's not immediately a reason to dismiss a model. The model can still be very interesting. So how do we model in this sense deep learning? So, you know, we kind of try to go along these, you know, several times around here and improve the model. That's also important here that you always start with something that is clearly unrealistic and then we look whether it captures what's happening and then improve it and go again and again and again and hopefully one day we will end up with something that we are happy with. So the model that kind of makes sense as a simplification of the real situation that actually as I will show on the next slide has been looked for a very long time in, uh, in physics is this teacher's teacher-student setting of a neural network. So the question here would be, when can a neural network learn a teacher neural network? So how am I defining the problem? I define a teacher neural network. So this is just feed-forward neural network in the, you know, in the usual sense. There is an input data. Then there are several layers. There are some ground-through weights of the, of the neurons. 
and with those and some activations and with those you generate labels the data here for simplicity you know in the model are taken iid but not only that the samples are iid but that the components of each of the samples are iid from each other so no structure just white noise on the input so all the information about the function is in uh, in the correlation between the labels and the inputs so that's a teacher network and then the student network is looking at the usual learning task where where you generate this way n samples of these inputs and outputs and then you try to learn the right function that goes from the inputs to the outputs and the question is how does the best achievable generalization error depend on the number of samples if you have few samples you will learn badly if you have more you will learn good so how does this best ge uh, generalization error depend of course if i could you know answer this in some good general uh, generality for realistic data that's kind of the learning curve that's what i want that's that you know from that i would learn basically i think everything you but assume, you assume this it's the same architecture good question so not necessarily so for simplicity i can tell the you know if i tell the right architecture to the student it will make it even simpler right now the student doesn't have to use the right architecture so in the simplest setting, all that I don't tell the student are the weights, but I tell him the activations, the, the, the number of layers, the width of the layers, okay. Of course, I can only turn it harder if this is not known, okay. But this is already very hard, actually. So, okay. So back then, in the 80s, when, you know, Yalikan was going to those conferences on neural networks, the simplest possible case of the teacher-student uh, neural network called Perceptron was actually suggested as studies. So by simplest possible, what is this? That's simply that when there are no hidden variables at all. So this is just generalized linear regression. It's linear regression because the weights just multiply the input data and it's generalized because the labels may be some function of that scalar product uh, over here, right? The labels are some function of the scalar product between the input data and the ground true teacher weights. So, so that's the setting suggested in this paper, you know, not called yet teacher student, it was called something like model B. And then in this setting, we look at the high dimensional regime because kind of we are having n numbers to learn if you think of these Ws as numbers to learn. And the number of samples is kind of how many equations we have to learn those numbers. So the dimension and the number of samples go to infinity, but with a ratio that is some constant. And then the, you know, the physics or the, the results in this paper are derived in this limit. So the two dimensions have a constant ratio, and that constant called alpha is a parameter in the, in the uh, resulting equations. So in this paper, they only suggested this problem. It was solved just a year after in another paper. And here, that's a case where actually the solution is very interesting. There's the case when the teacher uses binary weights. So the teacher is the single layer neural network, but the weights are just plus minus ones randomly. Okay? And in this paper, they computed the optimal generalization curve that as a function of this parameter alpha, which was the number of samples divided by the dimension, so larger alpha should get simpler, has this interesting form that it is some large number, so bad generalization, and then it sharply drops to zero. At alpha, that is 1.245 something. It drops to zero. So above that alpha, that's enough samples to learn exactly back this W star and hence be able to generalize perfectly. And that's uh, back then in the paper. And then, you know, this curve kind of sh comes from another curve that has an interesting shape. And, you know, so I could be spending the rest of the talk on like this history, going through the dozens of papers from that epoch. And, and but how the weights were learned using gradient descent, or this is what, is this some algorithm? Oh, okay, thank you for the question. This is the information theoretically optimal curve. So if you take the base optimal estimator for, 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 for the labels, you know, no algorithm can do better than that. And if you had exponential time, you can match this curve. Mm. Thank you, that's important. So it's not actually clear whether this is tractably doable. That's, that's important, as will, as, will be become, as will become clear in three slides. 
So they had a formula for this curve, the information theoretically best generalization error for this model. It's a very simple, specific model. Is the 1.245 is not a, is not a Say it again. 1.245 is actual number or it's a rounding number? It's rounded, yeah. It's, it's a result of some like uh, implicit formula that you can plug in Mathematica. But yeah, there are dot, 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 dot. You can compute as many digits of it. It's some, some like integral of the R function equals to something. And not nothing super complicated. So, so jumping forward up to last year or the year before that, where are we today kind of in terms of solving this no hidden, uh, hidden units, teacher, student, simple neural network? So in three points, you know, first of all, we can get the solution for any activation function and any separable prior on the teacher weights, so not only binary or Gaussian, but b Gaussian, but anything. There is just one formula where these, what is the activation function and what is the prior just appears in a form of a special function. So, so this is nice. We don't have to write every time a new paper and repeat the calculation. The second point is that we know how to clarify the algorithmic question. Like we have a conjecture of what's the was the algorithmically best achievable performance in terms of performance of this approximate message passing algorithm that is related to something that is in physics is called the TAP equations. And we also have a proof that that formula is actually the right formula for this model because back then, 40 years ago, this formula was obtained with this infamous replica method which at some point uses an assumption that is crazy and not at all mathematically justified and and nobody actually can prove it by justifying that assumption. The proof works completely around it. So, but today, you know, in this paper, we have a formula. We have a proof of the form of this generic formula for the optimal information theoretically optimal generalization error of this teacher-student model with no hidden units, with when any activation and any separable prime. So I could show you the formula and the proof, but rather than that, I show you the result and then kind of develop on that. So for instance, this is one case. I will be always plotting the generalization error as a function of this alpha parameter, number of samples divided by dimension. This is the case with a sine activation function and Gaussian prior on the teacher weights. So somehow, you know, maybe the first thing that back then people would try because back then the sine came from some biological motivation, you know, ReLU was not a thing back then. So the red curve, is the information theoretically optimal achievable generalization error. You cannot go below because you simply don't have enough samples. And the sign is losing a lot, right? So you are kind of measuring just one bit per sample. So if you don't have many samples, well, you cannot guess very it's well the W star. Because now we don't see this growth at 1.25. Yeah, before I will, g th the next slide is back, th before the W was binary. Now it's Gaussian. Okay. So you see these, these things change things. So here is Gaussian. And so red is the information theoretically optimal, black is this approximate message passing algorithm that in this case provably, fit, uh, provably lies on the red line, but this is for, I believe, 10,000, you know, just empirically checking that that's actually the case. And blue here is some logistic regression from scikit-learn, just saying that, you know, the, the approximate message passing algorithm knows everything about the model. That was your question, right? Except the vector w star, but everything else it knows. So it's kind of fine-tuned to that model. So that's why it can reach it. And the logistic regression is very kind of generic proposed. It doesn't know anything, but it's basically as good, right? Basically no gap. If that was kind of generically the case, we would be good. Yes, question? Is it the same as if we have some kind of gap or is it all one layer? No hidden units at all. So not even one hidden layer, zero. This is just generalized linear regression. Okay, I, I will be going back to the depth. Don't worry. But already this, you know, this is a non-trivial math. Like getting getting these generalization curves in this high-dimensional scaling up to the constant, as I just said. I mean, this is not something, you know, this is not something that one can readily get. So, but we need to proceed, you know, from the simple things if we want to get something like that for the more complicated ones, or maybe not. But anyway, that's our way of going. So now. Back to the binary case. So nothing changes here except that the teacher weights now are binary. But again, the algorithm knows about that, that they are binary, and is able to use that, but not quite perfectly. Right? The red line is the optimum, and the algorithm follows the green line, 
the approximate message parsing algorithm. And there is this, not very big, but you know, there is this face. This is the hard face. That's kind of, you know, that would be for another talk, but it's our conjecture of what's uh, actually algorithmically hard average algorithmic complexity problem. There is a conjecture that basically no, that, uh, no polynomial algorithm can actually find better generalization in this in this phase, even though if we had exponential power of you know testing all the possible plus and minus ones, we would follow the red line. But m more interesting for the purpose of this talk is the behavior of the logistic regression. That doesn't know the model and is totally not picking what's happening here. Okay, you know, nothing so surprising because it doesn't know the model. But now you, you see things can get worse. So here I play, I keep the weights binary but I play a little bit with the activation function of the teacher to make it more challenging. And it so happens if I take a sign of absolute value minus a constant so that half of the outputs are plus and half are minus ones, then it becomes harder that the generalization error doesn't even decrease at the beginning. It just stays as crappy as it was if I had no samples at all. There is again this hard phase, the difference between the red curve and the green curve, which is the op you know, conjectured optimal algorithm. And now to see what kind of the black box algorithm is doing, I have to go to the inset and change. Here I am like at twice the dimension of number of samples, and here I need to be at about 20. And here we played a little bit. We took, we ended up with some like three layer feed forward neural network with, I forgot the activations, but you know, just played for a day or two with how can we solve this classification problem. And basically with the standard backpropagation, you know, gradient descent based algorithm, we are not able to pick anything sensible below alpha 10. And even after that, it's nowhere close to zero. So there seems to be a big gap between the current state of the art black box and what's the best achievable performance in this model. So this is something worth understanding. Okay, but before going to understanding this gap between the gradient descent and the approximate message passing, let me be critical with myself, you know, answer your question. You know, is this bringing us towards the theory of deep learning? So let me go back to my triangle. You know, I want this to be realistic in these three ingredients. But so far, what I did in blue, I described white noise inputs and teacher outputs, no hidden units, and some message passing algorithm that is, you know, conjectured optimal, but its drawback is very much sensitive to the assumptions of the model. So it has no robustness properties and universal properties like gradient descent has, so no, not so good in practice. Whereas what we would need in green is you know, somehow realistically structured data, multiple wide layers, and gradient descent based algorithms and understanding of their performance. Yeah, so I'm comparing, so here I know the teacher network, right? The teacher, so, so, in a, so I could generate the test data with the teacher network, but I'm comparing directly to the teacher network. I mean, the teacher network is deterministic. So I'm just comparing what the estimator would be giving me compared to the teacher network. And the difference between the two, that's the error that I'm plotting. The MSE of that is the error that I'm plotting. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's true that I was using only classification because in all the examples I showed sign. Uh, yeah, in the paper we have like absolute value, you know, you, you can take anything. Like for the teacher that produces the Y, the nonlinearity can be anything. So, yeah, right, yes. This is just, I guess, drawback of the talk. And, and the curves, you know, nothing fundamentally changes. We have the prescription for the curves, and there are some curves, and they fit what's happening with the algorithm. And there is, you know, nothing so different we could see. The phase retrieval would basically look exactly like the last example. Minus 
So if you so so do you observe only the plus and minus ones? Yeah, I observe only those real life ones. Yes. So that would effectively just change the nonlinearity. Like the nonlinearity can actually be some probabilistic function. Yeah, it's it's I wrote it as a function, but it it includes noise in it if you have noise. So this this would just change this function phi. And that's all like in like actually in the formula I'm looking at the probability distribution between the output and what comes as the scalar product in it. Yeah. So and this can be, you know, it has to have like bounded second moment, like some like standard things, but but what you're saying can totally be this, yeah. And for the proof there are some additional assumptions that you need to, you know, but okay, I don't but morally, you know, this is not uh, this is not like uh, the difficult part here. So okay, so that's a good point to stop uh, for questions if there are more. The A and B uh, performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the other algorithm that I gave you was called SE. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, it can be um, SE. Oh, SE. That's yeah. That's for that stands for state evolution. State that's evolution. just the asymptotic prediction of the performance of the AMP. So uh, uh, very simple question. So the, these performances are provably provable performances of this. For algorithm this algorithm, yes, yes, okay. yes, that's provable. That's not our paper. That's in Montanari, Bayati, Javanmar. There is a series of paper from from Montanari's group where he proves that as the in this limit, the algorithm does exactly what this uh, green curve says. And the green curve is, again, some closed form formula that you can easily plot. Mm -hmm. So in this dense case, it's, it's, this is all settled. OK. So back to here. So now I want to go through the triangle. So I kind of the, 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 the most difficult part is this one. And I will start with this one. Like, how can we go to multiple white layers? So what can be done? So one thing that we can do at this point is something that is called in the physics literature the committee machine. So again, it goes back to old physics papers from the 90s, concretely this one by Schwarze. And we kind of took it and did the same thing as we did for the generalized uh, linear regression model. That is, you know, we proved that the formula is right up to a little assumption that is still there. It's not quite complete, the, the proof. We wrote the approximate message passing algorithm that you know, provably has the performance it has predicted by the formula, and generalized it to different activations, different priors on the weights. So what is this committee machine? It's a multi-layer neural network, which can have several layers if you want. But the caveat is that the limit in which our solution is valid is when the number of samples goes to infinity, the dimension goes to infinity, again, with fixed ratio. So this is the same, this is reasonable. And the number of hidden units stays of order one. So there are very few hidden units, like five. If the dimension is very big, number of samples is proportional, 10 times that, five hidden units. That's kind of the setting in which the formula holds. And this is important, okay? If the k was larger, I mean, it can be as large as you want once you send those to infinity. We don't really know where the crossover is. That's the limit in which the formula holds. And it's crucial. So what happens in this case? Well, we can kind of already in this simple case, already with two hidden units, this is just an example, we can put in evidence some like very like simple empirical facts, such that if you do in practice classification or regression, and you have very few samples, then there is no point to use deep learning. You just, you, you just do retrogression or kernel retrogression. Right? That's the best. And if you try deeper, you will not get a better result. And this is put in evidence in our analysis, because if I interpret this picture for you, there is a phase transition, a critical threshold of how many samples divided by the dimension we have, beyond which, below which, so if I have fewer samples than that, then the linear regression is matching the information theoretically optimal performance. So nothing else can do better. Whatever else you try, it will just match the linear regression or do worse. And above that number of samples, you can actually do better and actually realize that the teacher had two hidden units. And hence, also, the student should learn with two hidden units that are not the same. And that's why kind of this transition is called specialization phase transition. Because the student realizes that the two hidden units you have given to it should become specialized to the two hidden units of the teacher. So you know that's you know, a simple model where this kind of fact that with few samples linear regression is the best 
can be put in evidence. Oh, how interesting it is, you know, I found it interesting, but that, you know, it, it has its limitations. It's in the framework of the model. Another thing that you can get from this very simple model already is if you take the limit where n and dimension went to infinity first, and then the number of hidden units gets large, then, okay, the equation is simplified, we can actually do this expansion analytically, and we realize that, uh, that related to the specialization phase transition, there is a big computational gap. In the sense that information theoretically, to get good generalization, we would need some constant times the number of hidden units times dimension samples. But algorithmically, you know, to overcome this hard phase, we actually need some constant that I didn't write here, times square of the number of hidden units times dimension samples. <coughs> so there is a gap between the number of hidden units versus square of the number of hidden units. So in practice, it means you know, there is some, fa some number of samples below which you can do just linear regression. Then for a long time, information theoretically, you can do better, but you have no algorithms that would achieve it. And eventually, when you hit this k square, the approximate message passing would start doing good. And then somewhere after that, the gradient descent would start doing good. But this we didn't analyze in this model. So also an interesting kind of result. OK. So another thing that, that we have done, but I'm really, this is one of the slides where I just, if you're interested, I will tell you more. In this same model, in the same limit, what we can analyze is the one-pass stochastic gradient descent. So, so far I was very keen on the sample complexity, right? The number of samples was really just some number, small constant, bigger than the dimension. If I think of one pass stochastic gradient descent, I'm completely like sacrificing the, the sample complexity. I'm just taking one sample by one and I have infinite pool of samples if I need to. And in this setting, again, going back to, to series of works by Sad and Sola and other physics people in the 90s, we can write a closed set of ODs already in the limit, in the high dimension limit, but still the number of hidden units needs to be order one once that limit is taken. And with those ODs, what we studied in this paper is the overparameterized student networks, that is, when the width of the student is somewhat bigger than the width of the teacher. And we have a formula for the generalization error. It's kind of a complicated formula as a function of the which of the two layers is learned, the activation functions, the learning rate, the noise on the labels, the initialization, and the number of units in the teacher and student. So that's a lot of parameters, and there is a complicated zoology of things that are happening that are not quite all yet completely understood, even in such simple set. So that's just an advertisement. Now, let me get back to kind of the, yes, question. Yes, yes, that's a good, yeah, that's an AMP for the same architecture. We have, you know, this, this is a work that Andrea Montanari has approved, but it's not written somewhere, anywhere else, that mismatching the architecture in these models for AMP cannot help. It can only hurt you. So something like overparameterization helps is not true for AMP in these models, in the limits in which these solutions are correct. And yes, I'm using the knowledge of the architecture. I don't have to do that. If I don't do that, I still have the algorithm. I still have the proof of what the algorithm does. I lose the proof of the replica formula that relies on the fact that the model is the right one. In the proof, this is absolutely crucial. So I still have the close for formula, but it's in the status of the non-rigorous physics prediction. OK, I don't have like study with that to show. But this can be done with less uh, of a rigor of, of, the, of the match thing. Yes? But with question? the replica effect, you still get the same solution? It, allowing for differences, differences in architecture? So if you allow for differences in architecture, you can get only worse performance that if you ma than if you match the architecture. And you can quantify how much worse you get the corresponding curve depending how exactly you mismatch the architecture or the activation. And that's based on the replica factor? Yes. 
Yes, the replicator like, derives you a close for formula that you need to put in Mathematica evaluate when you get the curve. But the curve then depends on all these, all these details. So, you know, there is still some work to do actually going into the zoology of these things and learning what's happening actually. It has not been done as much as it should. That seems like a kind of surprising message to me that like changing the architecture, you know, doesn't help in some of these uh, regimes. I mean, can you say more? Well, I mean, is there any intuition for why that is? Uh, so maybe after the second part about the gradient uh, descent, that will be more suitable points to comment on that. Yes, because because basically to like go ahead is because of the algorithm. Uh -huh. Because a lot of these things that we see with the overparameterization in my in my interpretation are because of the algorithm. That this approximate message passing is like really optimal and it doesn't have it doesn't have the advantages but also it doesn't have the drawbacks of the gradient descent. Mm -hmm. So maybe these kinds of um, prescriptions would disappear with SGD, for example, as opposed to AMP or Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And we will see in, you know, in the algorithmic part mm -hmm. some example of that. Okay, so to this open problem, so what is, the, what is kind of the simplest uh, case that we don't know how to solve, even on the non-rigorous level, that is bugging us already uh, maybe five years or so, and that you know, if anybody knows that would be awesome. I would you know, gladly cite the solution in like uh, 20 follow-up papers because if we have this solution, there is really a lot to do. So is this following problem. Oops, sorry, I didn't want to do that. So I still have only one hidden layer, but I changed the scaling into something that I think is very reasonable in terms of like information theory and in terms of like writing a model that, 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 that makes sense to solve. I take the, the number of samples going to infinity, the dimension as well, the width of the hidden layer as well, and the size of the output as well. So it's kind of more sequence to sequence. It's not really classification or regression. I kind of need the, you know, on the input I have a order n times order n matrix, on the output as well, so that's order n square equations, and the ground true values of the weights, they were order n square of them. So if I want to kind of learn back the function information, theoretically this is a reasonable scaling. And I'm in the same student teach, teacher student setting. The inputs are IID matrix, the outputs are generated by the teacher. There are some ground true ways W, and I'm trying to learn the same function. So I don't know how to compute the generalization curve for this problem. So this is an open question. The optimal generalization error of the student is not known. And within the replica trick, within kind of the whole methodology that we have. What seems to be a problem is that this thing that I'm learning is a matrix. It's not just a vector, it's a matrix. Or it's not just order one of vectors, it's really something order, order n times order n. This, this just doesn't go through. This is for the sign, not the, uh, the activation, anything, anything. The sign, including, the sign. including sign, including sign. In, like, except linear, right? Linear ends up just PCA. But except if both the nonlinearities are linear, this, or maybe one of them can also, but if both are nonlinear, this is, we don't know how to do. Or actually, even if both are linear, yeah, even if both are linear, the kind of formula I need, I don't have it. I have like a tractable algorithm, but I don't have the formula. Is this related to hyperplane intersection learning problem, where which is, or some other problem? No, hyperplane no intersection, I think, would. But th this is not about algorithmic hardness. I'm in no way saying that this is algorithmically hard. This is just in, in terms of the analysis, in terms of tackling it. I don't, yeah, this, this should not be algorithmically hard. I mean, we can do it with gradient descent at, at some sample complexity, it will start working. This is not an algorithmic hardness problem. This is more our current limitation of our methodology problem. So if we could advance on that, we could advance on that, you know, on that architecture size. But we are stuck here. But I still want to make one point before going to the second, okay, <laughs> <laughs> second part of the talk about something that we can do, which is interesting, or I will not get there. That's that's life. So 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 this is a you know multi-layer neural network, and the neural network would be that we are learning Ws from samples of x and y. Okay, so that's the problem that we don't know how to solve. But the problem that we know how to solve, that we call multi-layer generalized linear estimation, is that if the Ws are known, 
and y is known, can we infer the x? You know, if there is some x star that generated that y, can from the y in we infer the x? So that's like an inverse problem of inverting, if you want, the neural network. So again, in the same limits that I was talking about for random IID weight matrices, we can solve that problem and we have a formula for it. You know, the same type of uh, kind of methodology formula. And this actually is quite interesting, so for at least two reasons. So two applications of that formula. So one application for those of you who heard about this information bottleneck theory, where you kind of need to evaluate the mutual informations between the different layers in the, in the deep net. The trouble there is to actually compute the mutual information, because that's like a high dimensional problem, computationally hard itself. With, with our formula and for somewhat changed learning of the layers, we can actually compute exactly that, uh, that mutual information in a very scalable way. So that, you know, we used it in this paper to kind of test some claims about this information bottleneck theory. And the second application, which also is very interesting, is that, that having this formula provides us theory for estimation problems. So estimation problems such as compress sensing or principal component analysis, you know, where the prior is a generative neural network prior. So the way I kind of, I just want to spend three slides on that. The way actually Soledad Vira, Villar put it, I like very much, is generative models are the new sparsity. So a, a big part of signal processing is solving inverse problems by assuming that the underlying signal is sparse. And this is a kind of a dimensional iterative reduction that allows us to actually do compressed sensing or sparse PCA, et cetera. But another way to reduce the dimensionality, rather than you say wavelets to, to do sparsity or total variational denoising that, that, that she does here, the denoising can be done by training a generative model on the data set and then using that as a prior. So this is a paper by Soledad, but the paper that kind of uh, did it in, did the, used the you know, kind of mainstream generative models the variational autoencoder and generative adverse cell networks is this paper by Bora, Jalal, Price, and Dimakis, which is kind of well known in the, in the business of signal processing these days. They got a very nice results by saying instead of assuming that in wavelets pictures are sparse, we assume that GAN learns the picture and we use that in the algorithm. And our formula provides a theory for that and has some very interesting implications. So in this paper, we looked at the sparse PCA problem. And I know there are some experts on the sparse PCA problem. And whereas we know that sparse PCA is one of these like, canonical problems where as the sparsity gets large, there is a huge algorithmic gap between what's information theoretically possible and what's algorithmically known to do. And there is you know, a relation to the planted clique and it's a very like, kind of theoretically interesting and well-studied problem. If we do the same with the generative model with random matrices, by kind of the dimension on which we are reducing, we kind of equal it or you know, say this is uh, what the sparsity would be in the, in the sparse PCA problem. What's interesting is that the algorithmic gap completely disappears. And this is something that we didn't expect. And this is something very interesting that would suggest that, if we are, that sparsity actually may not be such a good idea after all because it causes algorithmic hurdles. But if we actually use generative models at pr as priors, these algorithmic hurdles go away, and so signal processing would be much easier. That's, you know, we are not showing that because we are assuming that these weights are random and IID. We would need to prove something like that for the weights actually learned by the GAN, which we don't know how to do, but it's an interesting hypothesis I saw to mention. OK, so that's just a summary about the architecture. We can deal with order one hidden units. We cannot deal with even one wide layer so far with this methodology. But we can solve the inverse multi-layer generalized linear model. And that has some interesting applications in terms of computing the mutual information and analyzing the generative priors. So the second part, for which I have five minutes, roughly. No, what? No. Minus five, you know, I don't know. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, OK, a lot of time. So I will not get to the third part that I, that I assumed. But this, this part about the gradient descent. 
So let me go through that. So as I said, we know a lot about these message passing, but those are not you know, robust and widely used algorithms. We would like to learn about the gradient descent. And we saw in some of my pictures that, for instance, with the logistic regression, there were big gaps we would like to understand. So that's just the question. You know, gradient descent fuels deep learning, but we have very little understanding. Here I just put some keywords of recent progresses. But what we do is kind of co complementary to that. So gradient descent, we have some loss function. We can put weight decay, put noise. If we put the noise of certain variants that is completely random, we end up with what's called the Langevin algorithm, which has the nice property that it actually samples the posterior corresponding to the loss function. If you don't put any noise, that's just the gradient flow. Flow because it's in continuous time. The question is, how well does this do compared to the message passing you know, in, in our kind of problems? So to analyze that, it's, a, it's complicated. The fact that we have this state evolution for the approximate message passing, that we understand what it does, is very magical. Otherwise, you know, in, in, in high dimensional and non-convex problems, we have very little understanding of how complicated algorithms are doing. So this will not, you know, we would you know, like, for instance, to analyze it in the teacher-student model, but this is hard. And we, there are actually some works from from the field that are showing that kind of analytically this is hard to tackle. So we need to change the model. So it ends up that this spike tensor model that people study might be a good candidate, but not quite, because it has such a huge algorithmic gap that things are behaving not in a way that will kind of transfer the to, to, to other models. So if we want something universal, we came up with this model. So in the physics literature, this is something that would be called the 2 plus p spherical spin glass model. In kind of more the statistics literature, this is a this is an estimation problem that actually model that actually people use in some LDA in some topical modeling, where you uh, where you compute two point correlations between your latent variables. You observe a matrix that is a vector times this transpose plus a lot of noise. And on the same latent variables, you observe a tensor. That is you know, the vector p times with tensor product plus a lot of noise. And then you want to recover that vector back. The key parameters will be these two noises here. So the noise that you put in the matrix and the noise that you put on the tensor. And if you look at it as a, you know, as a, minimum, uh, as a maximum log likelihood estimator, it corresponds to to minimization of this function. And this kind of corresponds to the Hamiltonian of that model with the horrible name. So the two estimators that I kind of highlighted are interested is the Langevin algorithm that is you know, aiming to match the bias optimal performance and the gradient flow that is aiming to find the maximum likelihood. So now, before like, showing what the gradient flow is doing, let me show you the phase diagram of this model in terms of what's information theoretically possible and what the approximate message passing algorithm would do. So on the y-axis is one over the variance of the noise in the matrix, and the x-axis is the noise on the tensor. And you have three phases. So either it is information theoretically impossible to get any correlation with the signal because the two noises are too big, or the approximate message passing is giving you the optimal uh, correlation, or you have again this hard face here. So this is kind of the same story again. But now in this model, we can actually analyze what the gradient descent does. And that's interesting. So let's look at that, back to the gradient descent. How do we do that? So we again fish in the physics literature in the 90s. This time, this is a paper that I don't think is actually known at all in like statistics literature, but it's the paper that you know, has many citations because it's basically on the basis of our understanding of the dynamics of window glasses, of that material, of, of the material glass. And it so happens that it actually solves some, a model that is very similar to the model that I just defined. And with something called dynamical mean field theory, it's a little bit of a horrible set of equations to which it, it leads. But it's equations, again, written already in the limit of the dimension going large. And, this, and the dimension is not there anymore, and it's closed set of equations. 
they are integral differential equations on three variables that are not important. You know, they are closed set of equations that you can solve numerically. It's not completely trivial solving them numerically, but you can do that. And you learn about the behavior of the algorithm, which I uh, kind of show, uh, show here. So what is shown here is as one of the noises is getting smaller, I compare to the approximate message passing algorithm. The correlation with the ground truth is getting bigger and it's happening so faster. So this is intuitive, noise is getting smaller, I correlate, cor cor correlate more and faster. What happens with the Langevin algorithm is I correlate better as noise is getting smaller, but it takes longer. This is not intuitive. Noise is smaller, it should not take longer. Nevertheless, that's what's happening. And when we collect this time it takes, it actually diverges. And when we collect these divergences in this phase diagram, we realize that if we solve this problem with the Langevin algorithm, Langevin sampling, then there is an additional large hard phase in which the Langevin algorithm will not correlate with the ground truth. So this is something that we didn't, I mean, we kind of expected that from some other work last year, but if you asked me three years ago, I would bet that the Langevin will just do the same as the AMP, and that's not the case. It's strictly worse. And kind of non-trivially so, because as the noise is getting smaller, it should get easier, but for the Langevin, it gets harder. It's non-intuitive. If you do the same thing for the gradient flow, we get similar curve. It's a bit worse, which is not surprising because the Langevin is the base optimal estimator. The maximum likelihood is not optimal one, so it should get a bit worse performance, right? So just last few slides. Now, how do we explain usually kind of the popular explanation of gradial gradient flow failing? We say something like that. As the signal to noise ratio increases, there are spurious local minima, and when they all disappear because the signal to noise ratio is so big and there is only the good one that remains, the gradient descent goes there and that's at this trivialization phase transition where things start to get easy. So in this model, because it's you know, so, so nice, we can actually completely quantify this picture with the spurious local minima. We can count how many of them there are with a given correlation with the ground truth and at the given value of the corresponding log likelihoods of the tensor and of the matrix. And this is thanks to this Katzreis formula. That's some formula, you know, I just give it here, but I don't expect you to understand by no means. But it's something that we can plot and we can identify exactly where this trivialization phase transition, where all spurious local minima disappear, where it happens. So let me show you where it happens. It happens here. It does not explain when the gradient flow starts working. There is a region where there are spurious local minima, but the gradient flow is happily ignoring them and working. So this popular explanation is not quite the right explanation. And if you look more into our analysis, we can actually understand what's going on and get a line that is exactly the right line, but in interest of time, to understand what's wrong with this popular explanation, a picture that is actually exactly quantified by our, our analysis of this landscape with the Katzreis formula, the corrected picture is the following one. At least in this model, what matters for the gradient flow to work or not is not whether there are or not spruce local minima. It's whether the minima in which the gradient flow would get stuck are stable or not towards the spike. And with the Katzreis formula, we can exactly quantify that. And if we plot the line at which the highest minima that are also the most numerous that happen in this model to be the ones where the gradient flow gets stuck, get unstable towards the signal, so get settled towards the signal, this is also something that we like see in the formula, then this gives exactly the line here that goes through the points. So this is kind of, you know, down to the constant analysis of what gradient flow does in a high dimensional non-convex problem. So I, you know, may, maybe that's the first one, as far as I know. So I went a little bit fast through that. Then there was a third part through which I skipped. But let me go to the, you know, to the big conclusion is that 
You know, physics has many useful tools applicable in high dimensional inference and learning. You have seen several examples where fishing in some like papers from 90s and working a bit more and maybe proving things and drawing them in new cases. We kind of learn things that we didn't know before. And you know, I like to keep in mind this picture, basically going around it m several times, many times, and hopefully ended up ending up with a model that will kind of be nice and will explain more and more things. And the last slide is just the references if you want to read more about any of the things I actually talked about or even the things that I skipped. Okay. Thank you.